Well, good evening, everyone. It's so good to see you here this evening. We're getting ready to get started in, in just a minute. If you would be so kind as I ask you every week to go ahead and share this broadcast with someone, uh, perhaps start a watch party and try so we can try to get as many people to be a part of this as we possibly can. I see you, Tanya. I see my nephew, Ben. Hello, Ruth. Angela, how are you? First Lady is watching. Angela Samuel. Jakaya, good to see you. Vicki Reed, blessings to you all and to others that are joining us as we come along. Hi, Allison. If you would be so kind as to get your Bibles ready uh, while we're giving people a few more moments to come online with us. Uh, my cousin Walter Bailey is on. I see you, sir. God bless you. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we're going to be in the fifth chapter of Luke tonight. We're going to be reading from verses 27 through 32. So find your Bibles, get them ready as we prepare to go to the Word of God uh, tonight. That's Luke chapter 5, beginning at verse 27. We're going to be dealing with those uh, few short verses in their entirety, we're going to look at them tonight. The question that we're going to be addressing, uh, certainly with your permission and the aid of the Holy Spirit, is, is anyone beyond redemption? Is anyone beyond redemption? In other words, is there anyone who cannot be saved? Is there anyone who cannot be saved? So get your Bibles, share this with your circle of friends, start a watch party, and we'll get, get going here in just another minute or so. I would that you would sit prayerful and pray for me specifically as we break open this uh, word tonight. Again, we're in Luke chapter 5, beginning at verse... 27, Luke chapter 5, verse 27. Let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Father, I just thank you and I bless you for this opportunity to share with your people. Lord, speak to us tonight, minister to us right at the very point of our need. I praise you, O oh God, because you are have done great and wonderful things for us, and where we are exceedingly glad. Use this time for your glory. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. I see you, cousin. Hey, Aura, God bless you. I see you, Karen. God bless you. Glad to have you all on uh, with me this evening. Well, let's jump right in, shall we? And prayerfully, others will join in with us as we go along. The question that I'm chasing tonight is, is there anyone beyond redemption? Is there anyone beyond redemption? Now, I know that in many ways, this is a rhetorical question. Uh, of course, anyone can be redeemed. But when we are faced with events caused by seemingly the most despicable and evil people, uh, it begs the question, is anyone beyond redemption? Is there anyone who cannot be saved? It doesn't matter whether we're talking about the worst of mass murderers in history or the most heinous of uh, cyber bullies or those supposedly committed to serving and protecting. 
it still begs the question. And among the many challenges that we face during this pandemic, it seems as if we have now been faced again with violence perpetrated by those who are supposed to serve and protect us. I'm not sure how to respond to this. I, I see that, Karen, that doesn't seem to be freezing on my end, and I apologize for that. Uh, it just seems to me that this is something we deal with continually. And the reaction, of course, to this latest incident was met expectedly and very swiftly, even acerbically, uh, and entirely justifiably. And it still begs the question. I, I've, I've, not, I've not been one to talk a lot about this issue uh, because it's so easy to allow it to deteriorate into uh, some very hateful things. Mother Betty, I see you. Uh, but I, I was prodded to talk about this today as a result of, of my uh, morning Bible study. And in one of the many Bible studies that I do on a daily basis, the one daily verse that stuck out very strongly today was verse 27 in Luke chapter 5. I'm going to read this text to us, and then we're going to jump in it. Luke chapter 5. After that, he went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. And there was a great crowd of tax collectors and, and other people who were reclining at table with him. The Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, it is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The Lord always seems to know how to give you what you need precisely when you need it. I see you, Scott Bell, and I have a bishop. Thank you for joining us. It was this one verse, 27, after that he went out and noticed the tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow him. I'm not sure why this hit me in the way that it did, except that as I began to watch more of the news today, it suddenly began to gel in me. The things that I had been reading on social media, it all sort of began to hold together. I wanna to come back to this issue because what has struck me here is that there are certain things that we encounter that make us wonder more than just why do these things keep happening, but then also what should our response as believers be to these things. So let's go into the text, if we will. And I always like when I'm dealing with one particular passage to lift out the facts of that text. So I'm going to take a little bit of it at a time and outline the facts of the text. Fact number one, in chapter 27, uh, verse 27 of this chapter, the A clause, Jesus goes out, notices a tax gatherer named Matthew, 
and speaks to him. That's a fact. Jesus goes out. Now it says after that, uh, so whenever you see a phrase such as that, you have to wonder what is it that came before. And right before this, Jesus has healed a leper and a paralytic. And it's after those two incidents that he goes out from where he was. The people in verse, in verse 26 were all struck with astonishment. They were glorifying God. They were filled with reverence, saying, we have seen remarkable things today. And against that backdrop, out of that, Jesus goes out and he sees a tax collector, a tax gatherer, and he speaks to him. That's fact number one. The, the B clause uh, is what he said to him. He said to him basically two words, follow me. Now, presumably, uh, Levi did not know who Jesus was, certainly not personally and maybe only, if at all, marginally. And yet Jesus says to him, follow me. That's the second fact. He goes out and he sees a tax collector and he says, follow me. But fact number three is Levi's response. In verse 28, it says that Levi left everything behind, rose or got up and began to follow him. He goes out, he sees a tax gatherer, he speaks to him, he tells him, follow me. And immediately Levi gets up from where he is and leaves everything behind and follows Jesus. Uh, put, put a little pin there because I want to come back to there just a little bit later. Sister Bentu, I see you. Uh, fourth fact, verse 29, is that Matthew or Levi, as the New American Standard Bible refers to him, gives a big reception for Jesus in his house. Gives a big reception for him. And at that reception, there were others who were there. Cousin Valdry, I see you. There were others that were there. There was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with him. So fact one, Jesus leaves from where he was, sees a tax collector named Levi or Matthew. Fact two, tells him to follow him. Fact three, Levi gets up from where he is and he leaves everything behind him and follows him. And then fact four, Levi holds a huge reception attended by all of these other tax gatherers and various other assorted sinners. Fact number five, verse 31, uh, 30. The Pharisees and their scribes, the New American Standard Bible says, began to grumble at the disciples of Jesus and asking them, why is it that you eat with and drink with tax collectors, and sinners. Let's go a little further than that. The sixth fact is in verse 31. Jesus answers them and says, it is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. Mother Anne, I see you. Welcome and then in verse 32, Jesus goes on and he says, I have not come to righteous, uh, come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So here we have seven facts in this one passage of scripture. And every one of them speaks volumes to us. What we should glean from this is what is it that it means? As we read this text, is there a command that we should be following? 
Is there a promise that we should be claiming? Is there a warning that we should be heeding? Is there an example we ought to follow? Well, let's take a look at it. We'll go back to fact number one. Fact number one, if you remember, Jesus goes out from where he was and he encounters a tax gatherer by the name of Matthew or Levi, depending on your text. What are we supposed to gather by that? This is extremely significant because what we should understand is that with God, and Jesus was at the same time fully God and fully human. The Athanasian Creed said that he was very deus, that's in Latin, very deus, at very homo, truly God and truly man. And because he was both at the same time, he never does anything by accident. So what we should understand from this is that Jesus comes to us on purpose. Jesus knows where we are. Jesus knows where to find us and comes to speak to us. It should let us know that regardless of who you are, what you have been doing, whatever lifestyle you have been living, whatever choices in life that you have been making, that you have not been overlooked. And you should understand that it is not even a mistake that you are participating in this Bible study tonight. It may be that I tagged you, but you, you didn't have to tune in. But somehow within the providence of God, within the plan of God, you are watching and listening to this this night. Jesus doesn't come to you by accident. Everybody else may have overlooked you. Everybody else may have written you off. But Jesus comes to you on purpose, not by accident. The second thing that this means or should mean to us is is it's in the, the, the second fact, when Jesus says to Levi, follow me, that Jesus is compelled to come. He's compelled to come because we were created to walk with him. We were created to, to know him and to need him. And the call of Jesus to Levi is the same call to you and to me today. And it's very simple. Follow me. Follow me. And then he leaves the choice to us. Some of my cousins are watching this now from the other side of the country. We were all raised the same way. We were all raised within a holiness environment. We can never say that we did not hear the gospel proclaimed. We cannot say that we did not know the name of Jesus. But the one thing that I love about God is that he never takes away from us our free will. He never forces himself on us. He never looks beyond us. Peter says that it is the Father's desire that not a one of us should perish, but all should come to repentance. And that should be our desire as well. Don't think for a moment that God is surprised by the choices that we have made. Don't think for a moment that somehow uh, God was caught off guard by how we went left when we should have been going right. He was still there, desiring that we would be in fellowship with him. And yes, he knows that some will never come to repentance, but that doesn't negate his desire that we would. 
And so he comes to Levi and he says to him, follow me. The choice is left up to you. You can choose to follow Jesus or you can choose to follow your own particular path. And we see this over and over again throughout the entirety of scripture where choices are offered, but choices have been made. One of the greatest is when, when the word of God says, behold, I, 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 I hold out before you today life and death, but the hope is that you would choose life. But the choice is still ours. Nonetheless, nonetheless, I, I, I think that there's not anyone who is watching or who is listening that, that, that cannot admit, if we are honest, that there are things that I did, I knew they were wrong when I did them, I knew I shouldn't have done them, I had warning signs every step of the way, I, I, I might as well have been Will Robinson on Lost in Space and the robot saying, danger Will Robinson, danger Will Robinson, and yet in my own rebellious, sinful nature, I still chose to go the path that I did. Jesus is compelled to come because we were created to walk with him, to know him, and to need him. Hey, Pastor Rick, I see you, but let me go a little bit further because there's, there's another thing that we ought to take from this text. In verse 28, remember verse 28 it is that Levi or Matthew, he leaves everything behind and he begins to follow Jesus. What are we to take from that? Well, let's read it again. It says that he left everything behind. The New American Standard Version says he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. What are we to take from that? It's simply this that Jesus changes the direction of our lives, changes it completely. My sisters, my brothers, my friends, my family members, one of the things I've discovered in the living of these days is that we cannot ever follow Jesus, not truly follow Jesus, and stay where we are. If we are to follow Jesus, if we are to truly follow him, I'm not, I'm not talking about this super religiosity that most people go through where it's nothing more than, than, than just a, a ritualistic practice. My week goes better when I go to church, but I don't even really know where my Bible is. I don't know the difference between Matthew and Revelation. And if you tell me to turn to the book of Hezekiah, I'm flipping that. No, that, I'm not talking about that pseudo-religion. I'm, I'm talking about a genuine relationship. Hey, Lady Mabel, I see you. God bless you. I'm talking about a, a relationship with God that causes you to get up from where you are and to follow him. I know that there are some of you that are watching and listening to me right now who have had the experience over time when maybe you have been doing your quiet time in the Bible. Maybe you just picked up the Bible and wanted to read something, didn't even have a particular plan. The book just fell open to a verse and you began to read it, but somehow in the midst of it, what, you, what your eyes fell on was God's word to you in that moment and it was like a two by four right between your eyes. And it suddenly transformed. You know, the world calls that a ha -ha, an aha experience, but, but it was really a moment of revelation. God gave you revelation through his word and it caused you to get up from where you are, change your direction and follow him. You know, that's really the meaning of repentance. Repentance is more than saying, I'm sorry. Repentance is when you make a 180 turn and you go a completely different direction, but the direction you're going now is the direction that Jesus is leading. Levi, on two words, follow me, got up. Here's the thing that gets me, left everything behind. Do I dare say that there are some of us who are yet holding on things that we're not quite ready to let go? 
do I dare say that there are some of us that are still struggling to cling to some things from the past because we feel as though we can't really do without them. But Levi left every, everything behind. Jesus changes the direction of your life. I don't know how you feel about it, but that just gives me great joy. In verse 29, verse 29, it says, that's the verse that said that Matthew gave a reception. What are we to, what are we to glean from that? And at this reception, there were tax collectors and, and sinners that were reclining at the table with it. What are we to glean from that? And, and, and here's what I get. You, you only come to Jesus when you know you can't help yourself. That's, that's one thing. You only come to Jesus when you know you can't help yourself. Some of you listening know what it's like to hit the bottom of the barrel and you had no choice. God, I've done everything I know to do. I'm coming to you now. That's the first part of that. There's a preacher out of South Africa. Hey, Brother Rick. There's a preacher out of South Africa that I, that I like to watch, and he, he, he always says, if your God's not working, try mine. <laughs> If what you've been doing has been working, try Jesus. That's the first part of that. Here's the second part of that. Is Jesus was reclined at table, not just with Levi, but with Levi's co-workers and other assorted sinners. People that we super saved folk don't like to affiliate with. Those are not our kind of people. But Jesus was reclining that table with them. What are we to gather from that? And that's simply this, that, that Jesus is not ashamed to be associated with messy people. Now, I've, I've been in ministry more years than I care to count. Actually, it doesn't even seem like it's been that long. It seems like it's been just a short period of time. But I've been doing it for a while. I've encountered my share, even as a pastor, of messy people. I've encountered my share of people with whom I would prefer not to have to be bothered from time to time. And yet we don't get to make those kinds of choices. Jesus is not ashamed to associate with them, and neither should we. We should never be in the place of writing anybody off, no matter how horrid they are. Never write them off. You know, Paul says in Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. But the flip side of that is Jesus is not ashamed to associate with us. Let me go a little bit further. Verse 30. Verse 30, that's where the, the, the Pharisees were grumbling at the disciples, asking, why do you all eat and drink with sinners? And what the response is here that we should take is that there are always going to be things and people in our lives that will constantly try to divide our loyalties and Keep us from walking with and knowing Jesus. And it is the realization of desperate need in our life that drives us to Jesus. Hi, Angela Holland. God bless you. Drives us to Jesus. We're called at times to make some very difficult choices. I think one of the most difficult choices that we are called to make sometimes is of the influences that we allow around us. Jesus in his word has called us to be salt and light to a dark world, not a dark world to be salt and light to us. 
And yet the truth of the matter is that there are times when we let people get between us in our relationship with the Lord. This text teaches us that it's our desperate need that drives us to Jesus. And in that need, it will even cause us to invite other people in. I don't know what to tell you about your situation to that one who is asking you questions of, about how you seem to always be at peace and seems like nothing disturbs you and yet they know of the struggles that are in your life nonetheless and you look at them and say, listen, I, I, I don't know what to tell you, but I can introduce you to the one who impacted my life, who made a difference in my life, who with just two words, follow me, change the direction of my life. We bring other people along with us. The sad tragedy of the contemporary church is that we are no longer inviting people to come and recline that table with the master. That's the sad reality, is that we're not inviting people to come and meet the one whom we met and who made a, a definitive change in our lives. My friends, this text teaches us that it's not just us, but there's others that have a desperate need. How will they know that Jesus is still the answer if we don't tell them? Brother Robert, I see you. God bless you. How will they know? Friends, this is way more serious than any kind of traditional teaching on evangelism. We're talking literally about life and death here. Jesus came that we might have life and have it to the fullest. But how will others ever discover that life if we do not ever share it with them? Romans 1.16. Hey, Jordan. Romans 1.16 is one of my favorite verses. I have lots, but that's one of them. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not. I don't care who laughs at me. I don't care who mocks me. I don't care who dismisses me. I don't care who marginalizes me. I don't care who relegates me to, to whatever sideline they want. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I hope I've got one or two people out there who feel just like I do. But then here's another one. What well, else we're to take from this? Verse 31, if you remember, verse 31, fact. Jesus says in response to the criticism of the Pharisees. And may I say parenthetically that there will always be those who criticize us. Pastor Bobby, I see you. God bless you. There will always be those who will come along to criticize us. Don't worry about that. Go ahead and take that particularly if you know you're going in the right direction. They were grumbling and complaining, and Jesus steps in and he says, it is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. In other words, Jesus is saying, listen, y'all, this is what I came for. This is what I came for. I came to fix the sin gap that is keeping Levi. I came to fix that gap that's keeping him from being God's handmade creation. There are things in this life that are keeping people from walking in the 
the, the, the plan that God had for them right before the very foundation of the world. And some of you know for yourself, it's easy if you're not careful to get stuck. It's easy to begin to delude yourself and fool yourself that you're doing okay. And yet you're silently seething on the inside because you know you're stuck and you can't seem to find your way out. And Jesus is the answer for that. And so Jesus goes to the destitute. Jesus goes to the desperate. Jesus goes to the needy. Jesus goes to those who are not denying the current status that their souls are in. Let's be honest about it. If you're struggling right now because you're standing outside of a relationship with Jesus, admit it. God already knows it. We're the only ones that are fooling ourselves Thinking that we can handle this all by ourselves. Thinking that we can get through this. You know, I can handle my marriage by myself. I can handle my kids by myself. I can handle those business concerns by myself. I can handle the, the pull on my sinful nature. I can handle the things of the flesh. I can handle those things when the truth of the matter is that you have no resources in and of yourself to do anything other than to make a mess. And the good news is, is that Jesus <laughs> is not ashamed to be associated with you in your mess. So blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus says. The power of hope rests in the presence of Jesus. Jesus comes to you right where you are. One of the approaches that I've used over the years to lead people to Christ is something that comes out of Campus Crusade for Christ called the Four Spiritual Laws. And the first spiritual law says that we, that God loves us and offers a wonderful plan for our lives. The second one says that we are sinful and separated from God. And there's an image that goes with that second one that that, that shows this humong humongous chasm that it's standing in between sinful humanity and a holy God. Every one of our attempts to bridge that gap has failed. But Jesus reaches across that gap to us. He comes to us. He bridges that gap. He comes to us because we are in need of healing. So in the previous verses, Jesus heals a paralytic and Jesus heals a, a, not just a paralytic, but, but in, in those previous verses, it was, it was a paralytic and it was, uh, uh, I'm trying to get back to it, I, I don't want to misspeak, it, it was a paralytic and a leper, demonstrating that it's not just physical maladies that Jesus came to heal. He came to heal our human condition, even more importantly. So verse 32 tells us, remember verse 32 was, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I want you to get something. I want you to get this. We are all sinners. We've been saved by grace, but we're sinners nonetheless. And Jesus came to call us to repentance, to call us to turn around. So what we're to understand from this is that to follow Jesus demands our personal repentance. Hey, Sister Barbara, our personal repentance. So let me go back to where I started. Because what provoked this study for me was that one verse that was part of my devotional this morning, verse 27. After that, he went out and noticed the tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. The question that I was chasing is this. Is anybody 
beyond saving? Is there anyone beyond redemption? Now this is, I said it's a bit of a rhetorical question because the, the, the automatic response is, hey, Veronica, I see you. The automatic response is, of course, no, nobody's beyond it. God is God. But we're also flesh and blood. There's not a one of you that is sitting and watching this that, that has not had occasional moments where you wouldn't mind having been God for a moment with a choice lightning bolt to hurl at somebody because they ticked you off in just the right way. They didn't do what you think they ought to do. Or maybe they did something that has so troubled you that you put yourself in the place of God, making a heaven and a hell from them. May I say this to you? We are all continually troubled by the horrific things that happen around us. And particularly for those of us who are part of the African American community, we have had more than our share of things that cause us to go to such a dark place. We've had more than our share of things that so frustrate and anger us that we begin to wonder, where is God in the midst of this? And can this person, can these persons seriously be redeemed? I don't want to say a couple things to you. Number one, I share your pain. All of us of, of color have experienced prejudice in its various forms. Those of us who have raised boys know the fear of letting them go out Wondering, will they do the right thing if they're stopped? I can remember a time I was even stopped on my way somewhere to preach a revival service. And as horrific as these things are, and while we call for justice as we should, I want you to remember that our first responsibility as the people of God is to first of all give attention to our own personal repentance and second of all to pray for these individuals. Pray not for the perpetrators of the crime. Pray for those who investigated. Pray for those who adjudicated. Pray for those who give in to their baser, baser passions and take to the streets committing violence because of their anger and their frustration. Understand this. I'm not calling you, and nor does, not, nor does Jesus call you, to be anybody's doormat, to roll over and to play dead and just to play nice and pretend that certain things haven't happened, to overlook them. But I refuse to make a spiritual problem a political problem. Let me tell you something. I don't care how many laws are passed. You can never legislate morality. We are not dealing. We are not dealing with primarily a legal problem. Hey, nephew Adam, I see you. 
we are dealing with a spiritual problem. Paul teaches us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not flesh and blood. You can't fix this with a brick. You can't fix this tipping over police cars or lighting businesses on fire. This is a problem that concerns the hearts of people. Proverbs says this, that God holds the heart of the king in his hand and he turns it like courses of water whatever direction he wills. If you must go out and demonstrate, do it on your knees. Pray for those. Show love to those. Use your wisdom. Let your voice be heard. Encourage those who are in authority to do their jobs. But whatever you do, do not allow yourself to write anybody off. Nobody is beyond redemption. Nobody. Not the tax collector, not the sinner, not the prostitute, not the murderer, not the abuser, nobody. Nobody. I grieve over what is happening in our community. And I encourage those. I hear you, Brother Rick. I do. I do. I do. But this is something that only God can transform. We can't. Remember that it was Martin Luther King that said that all violence does is beget violence. Now, again, showing love is not rolling over. And we should understand this as parents because even at parents, there were times when we had to show tough love. A loved one of mine or yours may break the law and go to jail. And we know that they belong there. We know that they have to pay what they owe. But Brother Rick, you raise an important point. Because in our praying, we also need to pray for those who name themselves among the twice born, but are who quite honestly are struggling with these issues and I get it I get it several years ago and I'm, I'm just about out of time so I'm going to say this and I'm going to let it go and I'm going to pray for you all several years ago one of my students even a spiritual daughter this beautiful young lady loved the Lord sang in a mass choir at her church. She was a licensed minister at her church. She was a sweetheart, her parents' only child. And responding to a neighbor in distress, that neighbor ended up sitting on top of her, stabbing her to death. 
when the fire department arrived because a fire alarm had been called in, she was still sitting on her, stabbing her, though she was already dead. I can remember how angry this whole thing made because the woman who committed the crime didn't go to jail, was released to the custody of her family, and her family was charged with making sure that she stayed on her medication. I can remember sitting in my sanctuary and a television news reporter came to interview me because the parents of this young lady had come out and publicly forgiven the woman who had taken her baby, their baby. He had a daughter on his own. He came and he sat down and he interviewed me and I ended up ministering to him. It never made it to the air because I don't believe God sent him there for him to interview me, but for me to minister to him. And he was angry. All he could think about was his own daughter and what he would feel like as a parent if it had been his daughter. How could they forgive? How could they pray? How? 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 Every parent knows what it's like to feel that. There are some things that only the Holy Spirit can enable us to do even when it comes for praying for those who persecute us, who despitefully use us. Prayer can go where we can't go and do what we cannot do. And so I pray for those who are struggling, even as at times I struggle. And let's be honest about it. But understand this. God is not oblivious to our struggle. I feel like I need to pray right here. Because this just got way heavier than I wanted it to. And 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 I'm I'm so grateful, Brother Rick, that you you said that I praise God for your transparency. Thank you for that. Lord, hear our cry tonight. We come to you, O oh God, because we have no other place to go. You have the words of life. Speak them to us, O oh God. Speak them not just to us as individuals, O oh God, but speak to us as a community. Struggling again with another incident of senseless brutality. God, our hearts break for the family that has lost a loved one, for a community who has lost a citizen. And we confess it's difficult for us to even open our mouths and to pray for those who are responsible. But God, we're so thankful that you are God and you are God alone. And that ultimately, regardless of whatever justice that we call justice is meted out or not meted out here on the earth, that ultimately vengeance belongs to you and you will repay. Help us, oh God. Help us, oh God, to place this in your hands and to trust you to work your purpose out in the midst of them. So we pray for the police. We pray for the prosecutors. We pray for the brass, oh God, who will be looking at this issue. We pray for those who are investigating it, but we also pray for the community. We pray for those who are protesting. We pray for those who look for opportunities to do their dirty work. We pray in the midst of it all, God, that you might be glorified. So Lord, I not only pray for this situation, 
But Lord, I pray for those who are listening and watching me, who they themselves have been struggling with the issue of whether individuals in their lives or some person in their life is beyond redemption. Help them, O oh God, to let their yes be yes and their no be no. Let their desire be your desire, that none should perish but all come to repentance. And I bless you. I praise you for it. In Jesus strong, matchless, powerful name. Now help my sisters and my brothers to have peace, knowing that you are working your purposes out in this. May your will be done. May your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. Can you say amen? Well, God bless you. Listen, I don't want to end this, this uh, live stream without giving someone the opportunity to come to faith in Jesus. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus, I invite you to get to know him tonight. It's very simple. You can do that. Put into the comment field that you gave your life to Christ. Uh, if you'd like to be part of our cyber congregation, uh, just put in the comment field, hashtag KFCC membership. And then lastly, I want to offer you an opportunity to be generous, to sow. I thank God for you and for your ministry. And thank you so much for the comments that are coming in. God be praised. But I want to give you an opportunity to sow. And we offer you multiple ways that you can give electronically. You can go to our website, which is www.kingdomfellows.org. That's www.kingdomfellows.org. There is a secure PayPal link there that you can use to contribute. We also utilize the Cash App which is dollar sign kingdom fellows, dollar sign kingdom fellows. Hello there, Constance, kingdom fellows. And then if you have the Givelify app on your phone, we are listed in the Givelify app as Kingdom Fellowship Christian Center in Charlotte, North Carolina. Listen, whatever you give, we recognize and know that God is returning it to you. You can't beat God when it comes to giving. You're not giving to me. You're giving to the ministry that helps us to keep doing what we are doing. And we thank God for you. Bless you, Brother Sattar. Thank you so much. Uh, so I hope that you will give. Those who are part of KFCC, if you didn't tithe this past Sunday, didn't get a chance to pay your tithes or to give an offering, I'm looking for you to do that tonight. And then let me remind you that beginning this Sunday, beginning this Sunday, uh, we will take up a Thanksgiving offering in addition to our tithes and offerings. We will do that the last Sunday of every month from here on out. And it doesn't matter the amount that you bring. This is a, not a matter of equal, uh, of equal giving. It's just equal sacrifice. And we thank God, I thank God for you in advance uh, for your giving. Let me give those uh, giving options to you again. Uh, thank God for Lady Cece. We praise God for her that is uh, putting some of the notes in for you as we go along so you can refer back to it. But again, there is a PayPal link on our website. It's on the screen, www.kingdomfellows.org www.kingdomfellows.org and then our cash app is dollar sign kingdom fellows dollar sign kingdom fellows and then our third option for giving is the givelify app that you can have on your mobile device you can get it on your mobile device you can download it uh, it's called givelify g-i-v-e-l-i-f-y givelify and we are listed in givelify as 
Kingdom Fellowship Christian Center. Thank you, Lady Cece. It's on the bottom of your screen now. Kingdom Fellowship Christian Center. Thank you all so very much for your gifts. Yes, Veronica, that's correct. Dollar Sign Kingdom Fellows is our cash app. Thank you so very much. I love every one of you. There's not a thing you can do about it. Some of my cousins were on here from the West Coast. I thank God for you. Uh, or I saw you, Vaudrey, my dad's cousin, amen, but he's my cousin too, was on there. Uh, Walter was on it. I, I, my nephew, thank God for family being on. We love you all with the love of the Lord, and there's not a thing you can do about it. Amen. Karen Giles uh, Washington, God bless you. I see you, miss you. God be praised for you. Pray for us, would you? Pray for us and Lady Cece and for me. We've got some things going uh, that we're looking for God to do even greater things in us, and we appreciate all your prayers. Let me invite you to tune in again with us, and, and if you're in the area, we will be open on Sunday morning, and this coming Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. Hey, glory. And where we will be in the sanctuary, we will be social distancing. It's up to you uh, whether or not you feel safe to come. Uh, we will also be uh, doing the live stream, but we'll be open for those who want to come and worship with us on Sunday. Wear your mask if you want to, amen, to be safe. We want everybody to be very cautious. We will still be social distancing, uh, but we invite you to come and be with us at 10 o'clock. Our address is 2925 East Independence Boulevard in the Queen City of Charlotte, North Carolina, 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you. If you are unable to join us, amen. Uh, God bless you, Lady CC. If you're unable to join us, we will be on the live stream. We've had some difficulties and we apologize as I'm talking to people all over the country. One of the things my sister who's an engineer told me today said, listen, everybody's having struggles right now because the various providers never anticipated that their systems would be taxed to the limit that it is being taxed. That being said, that being said, we are doing our best to improve our stream. If you've missed any of our services, I do have a YouTube channel and I would invite every one of you, tell everybody you know to subscribe to Bishop Jim Logan, Bishop Jim Logan on YouTube. If I can get a thousand or more subscribers, then I can begin streaming on YouTube and not just on Facebook. Let me say one other thing to you. If some of you have not found it yet, if uh, you have, if you have the Amazon Fire Stick or one of those types of things on your television, you can get an app. Uh, I think it's called Watch. Facebook. Lady Cece, what's that called? Is it called Watch Facebook or Facebook Watch? It's an app where you, you, you can't utilize Facebook on your television like you can on your, your, your iPad or your phone or your device, but you can watch streams and other movies and things that are on Facebook right on your television. So I encourage you to watch us and we thank God for you. Listen, remember, nobody's beyond redemption. Till we have a chance to be together again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Amen.